Technology and Demography and Director of the Computational and Spatial Analysis Corps at Penn State. Um, and he is doing some amazing work and collecting a lot of different, uh, you know, sociology data and lots of different data related to the impact uh, that we are addressing in IHARP. So, without further ado, Dr. Guang Qingqi, um, we will welcome you to start your talk. Uh, thank you, uh, Vadana, uh, for the introduction. Uh, we don't use uh, WebEx at Penn State, so you know, if there's any technical issue, uh, please bear with me. Um, so, as uh, Vadana introduced, I'm a, a social scientist. I'm not a computer scientist, but I do work with uh, computer scientists a lot. So what I want to do is uh, I want to introduce our project, the Plowers project. And um, uh, following that, I want to spend a little bit more time on one of the study we are doing in the Arctic. So let me share my screen here. Projecting from there. Yeah. Do you see it now? Yes. Oh, I oh, think this is better. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, this Plurus project is funded by NSF, the uh, Navigating the New Arctic program. So uh, this project is uh, is among the first cohort of the funded projects, and it, it is a collaboration with uh, a bunch of other universities, including University of uh, Alaska Fairbanks and uh, Anchorage and Michigan Tech. Okay, um, so we are, are uh, our team is large, uh, so this is only some of us. Uh, so this is, um, we have uh, demographers, sociologists, economists, anthropologists, ecologists, uh, policy uh, studies, education, uh, from, from the four research institutes. And uh, um, so, the, and we also collaborate with the, the uh, several communities um, and the city governments. So the goal for our project, two major goals. Uh, one is we want to understand how the interconnected environmental stresses and uh, infrastructure uh, disruptions are affecting the Arctic Alaska communities. And then the second goal is based on what we've now, we learned we want to help them identify some of the important assets, including social, environmental, infrastructure, and institutional assets to help them to become more uh, resilient uh, to climate change. Uh, and um, so we have three research pillars. They are coastal change, uh, food security, and migration and community relocation. So here are the environmental changes we are looking at, you know, including the permafrost degradation. Uh, yeah, that's very unique to the, the Arctic. Um, and uh, also the sea ice uh, uh, diminishing, the flooding, uh, storm, the sea level rise. Uh, uh, but on the social uh, aspect, so we are, our team, as well as this project is heavily social science driven. So we are interested in the food security and the nutrition on um, the migration and community relocation, and then also economic factors, policies, and the household dynamics, and uh, how the indigenous communities are, are governed. Uh, also the local indigenous knowledges and uh, uh, also the government agencies from the federal to the state to the regional level. And uh, we also consider the ecological and uh, infrastructure perspective. So we, uh, our team is very interdisciplinary. So we try to integrate the different research pillars to uh, to understand these dynamics. And we take a very uh, a deeply a transdisciplinary approach to to create a significant impact through the integration of the research, the education, the outreach, uh, community engagement, and also international collaboration. Okay, so right now for this project, we have two study areas. One is in, and this is in Dillingham. This is the Bristol Bay region. Uh, this is uh, the largest salmon run sites in the world. Uh, and uh, the salmon production keep breaking the records in the past few years. The fishing season typically starts uh, in the late May and runs through the entire June. That um, region has about a population of 7,000 for that entire region the Bristol Bay Native Association. 
but during the fishing season, you can easily get uh, double the size of e, e migrants. They come in, work on, on, on fishing boat and uh, seafood processing companies. And the Chiwak uh, on the north, uh, well, to a little bit north, it is a much smaller community, only about a thousand population. Because of uh, coastal uh, erosion and the flooding, that community has relocated twice in the past 50 years. Okay, so the uh, three research pillars. The first one is to look at the human environment uh, hotspots. So we want to identify and predict the hotspot of the disruptions to the community and uh, infrastructure. Then um, we uh, we work with the local communities to co-produce the knowledge of the shoreline changes. Uh, we also produce demographic estimates and projections into the future. And uh, by all laying those layers together, so we predict the future hotspot, not only the current hotspot, but also the future hotspot. And uh, along the way, we develop user-friendly uh, risk assessment field protocols and uh, training modules. So uh, one example here is in, in Dillingham, uh, we have a sub team lead by Chris Mill from UEF, uh, who is studying a coastal hazard analysis. So uh, one particular issue in Dillingham is that their huge treatment facility uh, highlighted in that the red box, uh, the, the two uh, squares, that is next to the ocean and is threatened by coastal erosion. And that the city, the city Dillingham, wanted us to help them to monitor and assess the erosion. So we set up a monitoring site to collect data related to the erosion. We combined that with the historical remote sensing images, and we were able to produce estimate of the coastal erosion in the past 40 years. So you see those lines, you know, from 1980 to uh, 2001 until uh, 2020, and. Uh, we estimate that they lost about 15 feet of land each year. And based on that speed, it will only take 16 years, 16 years to reach to the uh, huge reach treatment facility, which is not much time. If you think about the lengthy process of identifying a site, finding funding for it and constructing it. And we provided the map products to, uh, to the city, help them to make decisions. And the last uh, September, uh, there is this uh, typhoon Mabok uh, hit the Western Alaska communities. That uh, they, they call that as a 50 year storm. And uh, Chiwak was one of our uh, study uh, site and uh, it was in the center of the storm. It was severely damaged by Mabok. And uh, the, the storm resulted in flooding of 15 miles into the land. And they lost hundreds of boats and uh, subsequent years. And some buildings uh, were underwater. So you, you see the picture on the top right. Uh, if we zoom in, you would see some of the buildings are underwater. So at the beginning, the community lost their power. And uh, once the storm ended, a federal and a state rescue teams, they went there to restore power. Our coordinators there told us that um, they have seen the largest helicopter um, with the rescue team members climb up and down the ladders. And then in the following week, we sent a small team with the five people when they are to assess the damage and conduct the education component of, uh, uh, of the project as scheduled. And uh, so our team brought lots of food there. Uh, one team member brought 13 languages of food there. And they have a, a quite productive experience there. So, uh, or there, um, so we work with local tribal st uh, staff members to collect GPS data of the maximum flooding uh, highs and use drones to document the impacts. So local partners also contribute their indigenous knowledge about the past environmental change and the impacts. Our second research pillar is food security and nutrition. So uh, if you study Alaska, you know that over 90% of the food in Alaska are imported. And uh, the food there are just huge, expensive. Uh, in the remote rural areas, food is even more expensive than in Anchorage, the largest city of Alaska. Um, so 
well, right now the you know the inflation is high. I, people complain about the price of egg or expensive enough. I was in one of the community last year. Uh, we stayed in a motel, and one egg, just one egg, cost three dollars. If you can think about, you know, how expensive that would be. And uh, so in rural uh, communities, they used to rely on subsistence, hunting, fishing, and uh, gathering berries. But the climate change is affecting the distribution and production of all the species. Uh, for example, you, nowadays you can rarely find caribou in the Bristol Bay area because they migrated to north. And um, so you had the record salmon production in the Bristol Bay region in the past few years. Uh, but the Waikiki Delta region, that's the second community we were studying, uh, has seen a big drop, a big drop in salmon production. So you see the variation, you know, that it could kind of become extreme. And also the berries are affected by the changing climate. Uh, the food from stores uh, is affected by the supply chain as well. So, so there are many factors and um, we are studying how the climate change impact food security and nutrition through the changes in the availability, accessibility, uh, convenience, and preference, uh, directly and indirectly, through uh, social changes, economic factors, uh, transportation, and communication uh, infrastructure. So we have um, uh, a child project during the pandemic to study the the pandemic impacts on on the access to uh, food bank and uh, pantry, and we were using uh, mobile phone data, so we can use the mobile phone data to link where people live to which food uh, pantry they use, and so we examine the relationships between the demographics and the socioeconomic status of the of their communities with the access to food pantry, and then we can also identify some of the food insecure, uh, insecure hotspots where the need is the greatest. Our third research chapter is about migration and community relocation. Um, so, you, you know, if you just open the news, you see the climate related, just so many, so many nowadays. Uh, and you also probably see news about climate migration. And when a community is threatened by natural hazards, such as flooding, sea level rise, or is devastated by natural disasters, such as hurricane, wildfire, people want to move. And there is a very big literature on the migration and community relocation in, the, in other parts of the world, in, in the lower latitude. But in, in the Arctic, the research is very limited. And uh, although we know that Arctic communities have been affected by climate change for a long time. There isn't a clear evidence that people move because of climate uh, factors. It's more because of other factors, because of job opportunities, or maybe they need to bring their kids to Anchorage for school, or maybe because uh, Anchorage has a good hospital and a facility they can use. We also find quite some interesting factors that the factors that keep people there, people just don't want to move. Um, you know, life there is kind of, uh, um, it can be tough, especially in winter, but, uh, um, you know, you can do hunting, you can catch fish, you, you get a berry, those are, you just can't do that in, in other parts, uh, the lower, lower uh, latitude. Uh, but the migration decision making is a very complex system, you know, who make the decision? Uh, is the decisions made at the individual level or as, or as a household together? Oh, this is the entire community. And where you move to? You move to the regional hub, you move to the big city, uh, all the lower states. Okay. And uh, also how long, how long you move? You know, is it going to be a permanent migra migration or you, this is a seasonal? So we, we also hear stories that, you know, there are lots of people there, just, just like myself, I, uh, Alaska is kind of imaginary, you know, it's, it looks, from movies, from books, it's so, so uh, fascinating. Uh, so they have lots of teachers, school teachers, they move there from the lower states. Uh, after two years, uh, you know, the life is just so tough. They can't bear with it and then they leave. And, uh, you know, 
At that time, they already built a really good relationship with the children. The school kids were just so sad that when they see teachers leave, that has been a, a pattern there for uh, quite a long time. And uh, so some communities are under severe climate-related threats. Uh, in Alaska, there are 29 communities experience significant erosion. Uh, 38 face flooding and 35 have major problems with uh, permafrost erosion. So uh, when you migrate yourself or with your family, you know, you, you know it's not an easy process. But if we talk about the relocation of an entire village, entire community, that can be even more difficult. Uh, money, money is the big factor here. And uh, in Alaska, relocating one family, just relocate just one house, can easily cost at least one to two million dollars. And for a small community with say fifty to one hundred household, that can be easily hundreds of millions of dollars. So where you get the money? And uh, there are some programs that can be utilized, but there are um, just so many uh, legal barriers there. So we recently we published a law review paper to uh, to review those barriers and make recommendations to help communities that are in the process of considering relocation. So at the state level, there are at least three programs: the FEMA, the HUD, and uh, the Bureau of India Affairs. They all have programs related to the community relocation. Um, but there are barriers for them to qualify for the uh, for the funding. So the first barrier is the definition, the, the definition of a disaster. What is a disaster? So disaster traditionally are defined as the rapid, sudden, or onset disasters such as flooding, tornadoes, hurricanes, but they don't uh, include a slow onset, granule, geophysical process. So in the Arctic context, uh, one unique thing is the former frost and coastal erosion. Okay, that, that is uh, prevalent, but that don't qualify communities for the federal program because it has not been included as a, a disaster. And also the term, their, their traditional knowledge use the term uh, Ustek. Okay, that is more relevant to the permafrost erosion, the coastal erosion, the, uh, the storm and the flooding. Okay, um, that can be one way, you know, you, use that knowledge to, to include in the definition. But even if a program is qualified uh, based on the definition, they still have to pass the second level of difficulty, which is the cost benefit uh, ratio and matching. So uh, these programs, they often consider other factors when, when they deciding uh, the resource relocation. Uh, one is cost benefit association so, uh, uh, ratio. So that, um, that makes Alaska communities less competitive because their population is small, those community um, population is small, and everything was way more expensive in Alaska. And uh, even some of the programs, the UN require non-federal funding match. For example, the FEMA requires 25% non-federal match. So where you can get the match, Especially for for a state for Alaska, you when you want to get this from Alaska state government, but Alaska just has so many communities that are facing the the threat. But even if you pass the first two requirement, okay, um, these communities they are typically they are small. They don't have much human capital to navigate through the long process. You know, you just think about when we submit our proposal. Think about that it involves lots of. Um, uh, staff members of, from different offices help us prepare the, the submission, the, the budget, the, the IRB stuff. And then you, if you want to uh, apply funding from the federal uh, programs, not, not want to do help with the community relocation, uh, that, that lots of paperwork there. Um, so one recommendation is that the, the, the federal and state programs, they can increase their coordination, their institutional coordination within and across the federal and state level. And uh, so, you know, for a small community that don't have a much uh, a human capital to navigate through the process, it would be very helpful. 
if these federal programs they could coordinate among themselves you know, for for the local communities to follow. And uh, another recommendation is that you know the, these uh, programs they could provide technical support at the community level. And um, yeah, also um, it would be helpful for the federal agencies to provide funding to create. A position such as like resilience officer positions, at least at some of the regional uh, uh, level. Okay, so uh, we also have uh, education component. So, um, so far we have been focusing on cl uh, on classroom and uh, uh, field activities on the uh, coastal hazards. So we invite local elders. Well, they have you know all the local and the traditional knowledge. So they provide stories and the history of climate change and the impacts in their community. And we also work with local teachers to co-develop a curricular. Um, and both students and teachers, they learn about the scientific concepts and the methods. And, and uh, in this uh, project um, and others, we emphasize the community engagement. We emphasize the co-production of knowledge from the very beginning, even before the proposal development from that stage to the end to the knowledge dissemination. Uh, we treat them as our collaborator, not as uh, a hired employee. Uh, we find that you know, the NSF, um, the NIA program, as well as the NSF level, they send out letters you know, to the researchers that uh, to conduct research in the indigenous communities, it is huge important to uh, engage, to respect, and work with them to co-produce knowledge. This is not just to help with the research, but also to make a bigger um, societal impact. So, um, yeah, we you know we when we go there, we try to engage our communities uh, through some of the meetings, some of the parties. Um, Okay, so that's that's just one quick um, quick taste uh, of the overall project. I did not give you any kind of technical details there. So what I want to do for the second half of this presentation is I just I choose one of our study. Um, this is um, also happened during the pandemic. We received another uh, child project to look at the perception, the difference of the perception uh, of the COVID risk in, uh, in Demingham. Okay. Uh, so we selected Demingham as our uh, study site. And uh, again, as I mentioned, that is the Bristol Bay region. That's uh, the, the Bristol Bay or uh, Demingham. That's the largest salmon run size. Um, and uh, during the fishing season, uh, at the end of uh, May to June, the, in that just in that one month, the peak season is really just two weeks. You have lots of people go there. You um, you have a captain, the the, the fishing boat captain, uh, crews, uh, and um, you have uh, lots of uh, seasonal workers go there to uh, to work in the fishing and the the seafood production and the, the seafood processing companies. Population can easily double during that time. Uh, in the past, people come from all over the world, uh, but during the pandemic, they mostly come from the lower states. Okay, so um, we had a scoping trip in the, in February 2020, right before pandemic uh, break out. And uh, so once we, we came back, you know, the, 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 the pandemic started and um, we, we heard from the, so we have contact with uh, Dillingham and uh, we heard that that community was divided. Uh, they haven't seen that divided for a long time. That in terms of that uh, half of the people say, no, we can't open the fishing season because the health risk is just so high. But the other, not, not really exactly half, but it's a big portion. The, the other uh, portion is says, well, we have no choice. Fishing is the only income. If we don't fishing, if we don't open the fishing season, then the entire year's income, we will not have that. So there is a big debate, you know, in terms from the health perspective, they really, their concern is really valid. They have only one regional hospital and that one hospital has only 16 beds and only two uh, ventilators. Okay. 
Um, but uh, based on our survey, we found that overall the, the community, they, they decided they want to support open the season and they open that. So we, um, so we want to, the, to have that study to identify what are the risk perceptions, both among the local residents as well as seasonal workers. And we want to understand their response to the policy uh, compliance uh, as well as follow up about the vaccine and the vaccination and the vaccine hesitation at all. So we conducted three rounds of uh, service. So totally we have uh, about the three, uh, 1000 respondents. And uh, we also did uh, 10 in depth interviews with the decision makers, the fishermen, the, 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 the crews, and the factory and the local residents. So, uh, Okay, so we use, you know, because these uh, things happen so quickly, so we decided to use a uh, Qualtrics online survey that, that can turn things quickly. And we use a snowball survey method through the network uh, of residents. We put the flyers at the processor plants, so put the, uh, their mailbox. So totally the valid responses uh, are just a little bit over 900. And look at the demographics uh, of the respondent. So among the, so it's about a little bit, so 50, 55% of them are Alaska residents. Others are from lower states. And we see the different race ethnicity, uh, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, and uh, um, uh, Asians and Indians and Hispanics. Uh, so we look at, they also look at their income, the comorbidity, the education level, and um, whether they work in, in working in fishing industry, and also if they have children or not. So um, we look at six measures, okay, three measures about perception of risk. So the first measure of perception of risk is the exposure. So we ask, are you worried about being exposed to the COVID? And you know, like give them a scale from a zero to 10, and zero is unlikely, and the 10 is they are highly concerned. And here, uh, just you know, look at compare the different risk ethnicity group. Uh, you see here, uh, white and black are the least concerned. They are least concerned about being getting exposed to COVID. And then, um, so so in the Alaska context, so this is uh, AI, AI, and that's mostly these are uh, in, indigenous communities. So you see indigenous communities and Hispanics, they are much higher concerned about being exposed compared to white and black. Then the second perception of risk we use the infection, say, do you worry about getting infected? Okay, so first of all, are you worried about getting exposed? Then if you get exposed, would you be worried about getting infected? So um, here, uh, again, um, well, white seems uh, less worried. Uh, here, the, the, the highest is indigenous community, although the Hispanic also were low. We don't know why is that. Uh, okay, um, and then we also ask, you know, if you, you get infected, would you or do you worry about getting a serious illness? Okay, the pattern happened again. So you see here, it's the white, black are less worried but indigenous and Hispanics, they are uh, really worried about getting, uh, getting ill, getting serious ill. So then we ask about some other information such as like, you know, there's this risk, why, can, why do you have to, to come to the fishing season? Can you just get a job, some, do something else? Okay, basically that's that kind of question is, we ask about the perception of, do you have an alternative opportunity? Uh, if you don't work, if you don't participate in this fishing season, could you find other job? Okay. Um, so you see here, white, black, their number is is higher. It's much higher than indigenous and Hispanic. Okay. Um, so they, they don't worry about the job as much as Hispanic and the indigenous community. And also about the income. Okay. Um, 
compared to other opportunities, how much money you can make by participating in this uh, fishing season. So you see, uh, this, um, there's not that big difference here. You know, we're similar across all the four risk ethnicity groups. So then we also ask them just compare work and health. What is more important? Is work is really that important than your health? Uh, you see here, uh, white, black, uh, that's, again, you know, we can, so white and black is higher than is indigenous and Hispanic. So what it says is white and black, they think, uh, well, maybe say the, the other way. So indigenous and Hispanics, they think health is more important than work. But if it's still the same group of people, that who participate in the fishing season. Okay, so we do more further analysis. So we run regression, uh, you know, with this, with those six out outcome variables, and then uh, you have some predictors. So we have um, uh, also we, we have created some of the interaction terms between the reset nasty and the income, and also stratify that by where they come from, where they live, and their job opportunities. Okay, so this graph. Okay, so let's look at it one time. So the left part, uh, well, so this one is for the non-residents. We compare the, the, the income, you know, the less, the, the low income and the high income, and we compare their perceived risk of the severe illness. And uh, you see here, it's uh, Hispanic has the highest perception of risk, uh, of severe risk, that is, um, okay, and, uh, oh, the, this is for non-residents, so we don't include the uh, indigenous population. So that is higher than black than the, the white. Then for the, the higher income group, okay, larger than 67, that's the median income level, $67,000. It is still the Hispanic has the highest perception, but the, the difference isn't as as severe as in the low income group. So you see that the income also make a difference there. And if you look at the residents, just look at people come from Alaska. It is the indigenous communities, the Alaska natives, they have the highest perception, okay, for the low income group. Then for the higher income, uh, the difference isn't that strong. Okay, then we also try to compare see their job opportunity. Can you find a job other somewhere else? So the left uh, part shows that it says that it's definitely not or probably not able to find it. And in this group, uh, so the low income, the Hispanic and Alaska native, they have the highest perception. Okay, so this group uh, uh, um, much higher than the black and uh, white. There is also some difference there for the higher income group, uh, but, but it's a little bit noisy there. Uh, so now the Alaska natives for the higher income group uh, have the lowest perception of the risk. Um, so if for, for, for the right side, those two, two uh, for the, the two columns on the right, if they can find other jobs, you see the difference isn't that uh, great. So the conclusion here is that Alaska natives and Hispanic respondents, these two groups, they make less than median income uh, generally, but they perceive uh, the COVID illness as a, se a severe threat, but they still choose to work. Okay. Um, and uh, so this is really uh, their decision is driven by income and uh, job opportunities. So by the way, so I, I forgot to mention that the Hispanic, Hispanic uh, res, uh, respondents, a large portion of them come from the rural states. Okay, they are seasonal workers. Okay, uh, so some of the work, ongoing work that the, uh, we are using a, a lottery based risk uh, method to, uh, to look at the the per the preference for and against the risk behavior, whether that how that is uh, uh, associated with uh, the COVID risk perception, and how they uh, they view 
uh, policy activities. So we also uh, we provide the the results to um, the local community, and uh, based on that, they modified their requirement. Uh, so at the beginning, you know, it was very strict. You have to have uh, if you go there, go to the local communities. You have to have the vaccine, or you have to have the the test. Once you are reach Anchorage Airport, uh, typically, you know, those small villages they have a flight to Anchorage. That's probably the ma major airport they can reach to uh, from there to their village. Um, and then once you landed in their community, you need to do another test, and then you need to have a uh, a quarantine, um, so lots of them, and uh, so they, they removed some of the uh, the requirements. So uh, last year when we go there, if they don't require that. We once we just land there, we did a test, and uh, we are fine. Then, then everything. Then we just they let us just do what we needed to do there. Okay. Um. So I just going to just stop here. You know, if you have uh, any questions, uh, please let me. I am going. To, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Muted. Sorry. Should I, should I uh, stop sharing my screen? Yes, yes, that, that sounds good. Um, can I turn this on a little bit? Yeah. yeah there's. All right, great. Thank you. We are trying to fiddle here in the uh, conference room because, like I said, you know, there's some campus challenges. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I think there's lots of relevant intersections with the work that you have done. I'm curious if folks have questions. I have questions as well, but I want to see if anybody wants to start with the Q&A. Anybody has questions? I have one. Uh, hello. Uh, Go ahead. Dr. This is Jian Wu Wang from uh, UMBC. Uh, thanks for the good talk. Uh, I wonder, um, in in the whole project of the uh, Polaris, uh, how do do you use any uh, causality uh, related uh, uh, analysis to understand uh, what's the reasons for some of the behavior, some of uh, uh, congruence or uh, actions? Uh, I know. Uh, causal study uh, has been uh, used for different disciplines. I think in the data science, we have been using it to understand some behavior. I wonder in, the, in your research area or in this project, uh, do, do you think that this will, uh, causality analysis will play a role in, in your uh, research in this, in this project? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so yes, we, yes, I don't know how we do have a wine economist on the team who want to do this. We have the data. Unfortunately, uh, he has not get the time to really to generate the results yet. Yeah, if you have a, a you know articles or reference that you could share, that that would be appreciated uh, in sure. that area of the behavior part. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um... There are question from chat. Yeah, I think there's a comment. Sylvia has a comment about the insights into dynamics and external factors that drive the migration uh, and uh, other things. And, you know, I have, I have a related question. You mentioned that working with the local communities, it's really about respecting them, engaging them, really working closely, you know, recruiting local researchers. I'm curious if you can share any insights on how you got started with that, because we are doing a lot of work in IHARP and I think there could be relevant impacts for the communities that we want to bring it back. I'm curious how you approach that. Yeah, uh, yeah yes, that, 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 that's a very important question. So the, I guess this will vary by the project. Um, so for our project and uh, also some other projects that I know, that we needed to collect data there. And um, so the ideal procedure should be that we, we before we do, we write our proposal. We, we want to meet with them to understand what they, their needs are. Quite often, mm -hmm. uh, we, we find out uh, over the course of the, the, the communication with them, what we as researchers are interested in may not be what they are concerned at all. 
So, um, so it is important that if you already have, you know, you feel that connection at the early stage so that you can work with them, know what they are interested in and write a proposal that not only serve the research uh, purpose, but also serve their needs. That would be the ideal, ideal situation. But in practice, I think, you know, uh, that is not going to be easy, especially for those of us in the lower states. Alaska, University of Alaska, Fairbank, Anchorage, some of them, they have better connections. So for us, when we started this uh, research, uh, well, when we, before we write this proposal, uh, we, I don't have connection in the indigenous communities. So I reach out to uh, researchers in Alaska and uh, they, they have uh, uh, well, so we have several people from Alaska. So one of them is from the Sea Grant. He is a um, local community specialist. He has lots of uh, experience there. So he helped us to have that, build that connection. But even that, you know, during after the project is funded, once we get there, we find out that what the proposal we we wrote does not really match that well with with their concern. And their concern can also vary from one community to another. So uh, that's uh, that has been challenging. Um, I, I, that that is not you know, that is not unique to us. I, I think that challenge is universal to to, to many projects. My understanding of your project is more data driven. Uh, that I guess if you care more about the the next stage, which is the data dissemination part, I think that is. Uh, that can be very uh, impactful and it can be quite a welcoming by local communities. The one thing is, so in our project, one of the challenge we, well, not the challenge, one thing we, we are doing is, so besides we write research papers, we also uh, set up a requirement that for each research paper, uh, the, the authors need to write a community version of the paper. So, like, just a two page, a two page, just share the findings and it needs to be written in sixth grade uh, reading level. Uh, you know, our, our uh, collaborators in the local community, they say, hey, this is too hard to understand. You got to make it simple. I'm really simple, you know. So, uh, yes, um, I, I think that they, they like that kind of products. Very good. I, I see lots of comments on the chat uh, from yeah. Sylvia as well and questions. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll read out. I know Sylvia has some uh, technical difficulties with the voice. So the first question she had was around how does indigenous knowledge change your approach? Yeah, uh, that one, I, I think I answered your question apparently uh, is so, yes. So, so after we get our flowers project, uh, we receive a, Three or four, maybe four, four projects, uh, four awards uh, from uh, four additional awards from uh, NSF. So all of those are based on the communications, based on their feedback. Like this, uh, for example, like this, uh, the second part of this partition about the COVID impacts. So that is based on their, not necessarily about indigenous knowledge. This is more about their feedback. You know what their needs are. And uh, so we have another project. A look at the bridge. So. One community, they, they build a bridge, uh, connect them to the, the mainland, not, not the lower states, but it's all isolated community. So that changed their life a lot. So they are, they were curious about, you know, compare, although we think that is going to be all about positive impacts, but they also have some negative impacts that they complain to many visitors and have uh, to their village. But anyway, so. Uh, our approach is that once we start to talk with them, to build a connection with them uh, and think from their perspective, you know, there are just so many, uh, so many research we could do to help them. Sylvia, do you, uh, do I answer your question or are you asking more specifically about the indigenous knowledge? Yeah, I, that, that I don't know if uh, I answer your question. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think Sylvia might have. Uh, yeah, she said yes. Um, another question that Sylvia had was or comment in question is appreciate your work. Pre engagement with of pre engagement with community and ensuring participation. Are there tri tribal leadership? Or is it all local? Do you have tribal leadership 
as well involved? Uh, typically, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so typically, when we work with the local community, uh, before we do any data collection, uh, we need approval from at least two entities. One is their tribal council. Another is their, uh, sometimes it's a, a village council or, or a city. Uh, so these are two diff different entities. The city or the village, um, they would more focus on the infrastructure stuff, but the tribal uh, council, they have, uh, you know, they are kind of a, find a term so 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 they are more like the the moral or more the the leadership the decision making and makers that can can, can have a, a huge impacts uh that so every time we do research in any of them we need approval from both some communities are more easy to work with some others uh are not that easy uh you know there's the uh well there there is this uh, bias against scientists in those local communities I mean, if you know about those things um so there's the history you know this is in, in tribals they were treated badly uh just by by the society uh in the history but also from the research perspective researchers are often seen as snow gates the term that you say snow gates snow gates they fly in the same time of the year grab the data and then you fly away you don't leave any valuable stuff for them so they have the, some of the communities have quite a negative uh, perception. Also, this is not just scientists, but also like you think about their, the state or the federal government, some of the agencies, they also conduct, uh, they, they collect data or maybe they implement policies. Okay, that can create a tension and, and that will affect us. So one example would be, uh, you think about in the North Slope, they do, uh, they do weaving, you know, weaving, they catch a wheel, okay. And the, the Department of Fish and Game, they will say how many quotes you have for each village. You know, they say, hey, uh, based on our scientific estimate, this year there will be only this much wheel. So in order to preserve them, you can only catch this much this year. But then they, based on their local knowledge or traditional knowledge, they say, that's, that's totally wrong. Uh, based on our uh, prediction, this year is going to be a big year. So there's always that, kind of, well, not always, there's sometimes there's that kind of conflict. And the, that would, uh, you know, any of the outsiders come in, kind of like scientists or like people from the government uh, can be, uh, cannot be uh, be uh, perceived positively. Yeah, great. I think Sylvia has a couple of, uh, you know, appreciative comments on the work, like the two pager idea and the language level that you mentioned, and then also, uh, uh, an appreciative comment about the study uh, on how it should be done during these uh, in these circumstances and i'll just read out the comment thank you for putting nsf concerns on working with indigenous people and guidance i i think it's really an exemplar um i want to be cognizant also if there are other questions anybody else wants to share or ask questions Well, thank you. Uh, so the, I, I think the approach that your group is doing is also quite effective. Um, you know, the data is a big issue. Data availability is a big challenge in, in uh, Arctic research, especially solar science data is, is terribly limited. Um, that I really I admire that your group using the big data approach, try to integrate data from different sources, do something that, that that's, uh, that's uh, amazing. And I think one of the things that we are trying to do uh, is complementary. And I want to go back to your point about sharing data back to the community. So we are looking at the, the scientific data, data from remote sensing satellites collected about the effects that we are seeing on the ground and incorporating them in big data models. But taking it back to the community is something we want to develop more is yeah. once we have these findings, these relationships, even the causal relationships and such, how do we take it back to the community? Because you said a very important thing about the trust on scientists. Yeah. How do we develop that? I think that's still a question mark for many of us, uh, and we have to start building that. So maybe we can share lessons learned or learn from your experiences and build that. 
Yeah, well, we're happy to share. That's great. Wonderful. One 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 comment from uh, is uh, I think uh, these two projects are um, looking at similar uh, regions, but very uh, a little bit different uh, uh, angles. Uh, I have we, we look mostly on the global observations and. Uh, each uh, like each point is covers many many kilometers at least, and so that one pixel we are looking at uh, as that that's a more global picture. I think uh, for you, Dr. Chi, you are uh, studying from a local um, perspective. Uh, I think uh, either if if I can find a way to combine this local perspective data and the global perspective data, that would be a comprehensive uh, com complementary to each other. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, um, I, I, I think we should use whatever data is available that we can access to. It's just a work costly to collect data there. For geoscience, it's expensive, but for social science, it's even more expensive and even more time consuming. I know there are students on here who are doing interesting studies on human trafficking and related data. I'm curious if there's any questions on that or uh, I, I know Dr. Chi also does related work in that space on migration. Well, then this will be me, but I'm really sorry that I joined the uh, talk very, very late. So I don't think at this time I will have a question, but I will be listening to the recording and I will be touching back again with you, Dr. Chi. But thank you yeah. so much for your time. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I, I'll probably uh, ask a question on Sadie's behalf because I, I know her interest as well. One of the things that, uh, you know, Sadie, for example, is trying to look at is narratives of people uh, and capturing information through narratives. I'm curious if you have a lot of different data elements and surveys that you've done. Um, are there stories that you have captured or there is a need to capture where we can see from their narratives what are the climate change change impacts happening in the local communities because what we are looking at right now is global but there could be opportunities to look at narratives at the local level as well yeah uh, for, for, first of all i i, I uh, have not done work on, on the the uh, what's that I, well i'm sorry uh, narratives yeah. yeah yeah well not the, the other the well yeah, anyway, exactly. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, city, your your topic. I, I I haven't done that work, so don't know much about that. That was not the focus of our project, uh, but we do look at the climate change impacts on migration just in general, not that particular uh, group. Um, in terms of the, you say the 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 story. Yeah, I I I do think um, if you want to like uh, well, one way that I think can be quite a, a impactful is writing stories uh, from personal level. Yeah, so, so, um, uh, but then I, I think you make a really good point there is, um, well, there are quite some interesting stories when you start to talk with people to do the interviews. Uh, I, well, so if you, if we think about like, just in the general public, scientists are, are not perceived that, re that high respect uh, either. Uh, so, you know, people don't really trust scientific evidence or care about scientific evidence that much. So, part of it is the communication. Uh, there are some push, I guess, from the university level. I assume many universities are doing that to do scientific communication, um, to write stories based on the findings, or even just based on the interviews to write that kind of personal story. I think that can be quite uh, impactful. Uh, just anecdotally, last year I started to uh, write op-ed articles, uh, uh, publish on on the major news media, not the scientific journal uh, journals. Uh, I find that is quite an interesting experience. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure we'll have lots of follow up with you. You know, continuing our previous conversation on this. Um, are there any other questions at this time? And Sylvia, please feel free to keep writing comments if you want to add. I'm sure we have lots of space for comments. Anybody else? All right. Great. I think um, 
this was a very, very interesting insight and a very nice complimentary view to the work in IHARP. So I'm sure there'll, there'll be lots of follow up, Dr. Chi, and we'll, we'll definitely circle back with you on that. Um, with yeah. that, I'd like to thank you for, for the talk as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, feel free to email me if you get questions or you want to chat more. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Wonderful. Thank you. Take yeah. care, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye.